Okay, welcome to our discussion tonight. We are going to be talking about pest and disease management tonight from the perspective of soil health and regenerative agriculture and organic gardening and all that stuff. Now, you got to remember, anytime I say organic gardening, I'm talking about pre-1980s stuff. If you've learned about organic gardening in the 90s or the 2000s, that is not what I'm talking about because I do not buy products to put on the land that are labeled organic. I make all my own products. I just collect them from the wild or I make them. I'd want to remind you all about the things that you are able to participate in that we are doing. We have our Feed Your Family Boot Camp, which is normally a three-day event, although I have done others for people that were longer and I've done some that were shorter depending on the needs of the people who come. But normally it's a three-day event where you come and I teach you everything that you need to know to go home and grow food for your own family. This is a super fun event. Everybody has enjoyed it. And the people who've got the most out of it are people who have never gardened before. So this is certainly for beginners, for sure. Um, I've had a lot of advanced gardeners come and they enjoyed it also although uh we get into a lot of arguments <laughs> but but they're always friendly so that's good and then we have our 17 week farmer training class and uh we're right in the middle of that right now i have two full-time students but i've had about seven different students throughout this year who have come and gone um, and they have all enjoyed it and loved it and our two students who have been here all summer are prepared to go home with the skills to make enough food to feed their communities or whatever it is they decide to do with the, what they've learned here. Also, I do consultations to help you set up your own farm. If you need soil samples done or any kind of soil health work done on your farm, if you have pests or disease or fertility issues or production issues, I can help. And then, of course, I have my free YouTube channel where you can watch YouTube um, videos. I have hundreds of those on there all about the farm and what we are doing. And I have my Patreon subscription, which is a paid subscription that you pay for monthly and you have access to my entire video library. So you can go in there and look up the things that you need to study and learn and you can see if I have made videos about it. Also, you can get on the chat in those videos and ask me questions about the videos and I can answer those for you. Also with Patreon, you can ask me specific things and quite often I will make a video to answer your question. I can't promise that I can always do that, but I have done that many, many times for people. And if you need more information, you can go to my website, which is www.georgicrevolution.com. Let's get into pest and disease management. <laughs> In the past, like when I went to college 20 years ago, it's been longer than that now, but they used to call it integrated pest and disease management. And we would integrate the world of the organics with the world of conventional. And we would start with the best things, the easiest things, the things that made the most sense when we would find a pest. So we were out there and we were looking all the time for any kind of a pest or a disease. So we would monitor the fields every day. We would go into the gardens and the fields. If you had a lot of acres, you would need to hire people to do this because you would want to be watching for any organism out there that could cause a problem. And then you would... Uh, go out there and you would keep charts of what you're seeing. And over the decades, if you kept good records, you could see trends so that you could predict when problems would happen. That's the way I was taught. And it's actually a very good management system. If you do have issues with pests and disease, you need to understand that your soil is not functioning. Let me say that again. If you have problems with pests and disease, that is an indicator that your soil is not functioning properly, okay? That is, it is not an indicator that an angry God sent in 
a plague to wipe you out. That is not what it means. And uh, there's been a lot of people in my life who just think, oh, this is just an act of nature or an act of God. There's nothing I can do about it. There's actually a lot we can do about it. We can fix our uh, water cycle. We can fix our nutrient cycling. We can fix a lot of things to get our soil functioning so that the pests and disease fulfill their natural ecological role. So let me just define that real quick. <laughs> the natural ecological role of a pest and a disease, they are the cleanup crew to fix the problems that are occurring in nature. In other words, if there are plants that are unhealthy, they will be consumed by certain um, organisms, which humans have called pests and diseases, but actually they're the first responders to serious problems, serious um, you know, deficiencies, serious plagues, all the weird things that could happen in nature that makes a crop unhealthy, uh, the, the pests and disease just go into that ecosystem and they will clean up the unhealthy plants. But as farmers, we don't interpret it that way because we work so hard that we think that our crops are healthy. And then um, when the pests attack, we think that the pest is a problem. 99% of the time, I really should say 100% of the time, but I could be wrong. So 99% of the time, a pest or a disease is an indicator to you that your soil doesn't function. So when we go out there and we walk our, walk our garden and we're looking for potential problems, we're looking for the bugs that will eat our stuff. We are looking for the de decomposers that are destroying our plants. When we find those, it tells us that we don't need to kill the bugs. We need to fix our soil. So we need to be preventing our problems before they get bad. So we need to keep the plants healthy with really good soil management so they don't get sick in the first place. And is this possible? Absolutely, it's possible. There are all kinds of farmers all over the world proving that this theory is true. Let's say that you do have a crop that does have a big problem and it's wiping something out. Sometimes it's a good idea to just dispose of the crop instead of spraying it because spraying the crop with say a pesticide or a fungicide or any other kind of a poison to try to clean up a pest or a disease, what you're gonna be doing is killing off all of your good organisms also. And so that makes room for more bad organisms to come in and to cause you more problems in the future. So I like to just compost things that are not doing well and then work on my soil health. And I don't worry about the trying to get rid of disease species or pest species. Um, sometimes there's uh, little bugs that come through like uh, the imported cabbage worm or the cabbage looper, um, things like that that fly. And so if you cover your uh, plants with some kind of a floating row cover or a netting, tulle fabric works great. I love tulle fabric. It's the same thing that you, they make wedding dress veils out of. But they work really good to keep the flying insects off. In the eastern United States, I know I have people on here who listen to these recordings from the east. And the, the uh, Japanese beetles are bad out there and they're eating things like green beans <laughs> and those are uh those can be a real problem well green beans are self pollinating so if you cover them up people think and they're wrong when they think this but people think well, if i cover it up the pollinators can't get in and pollinate my green beans well very few green beans are pollinated by a bug anyway they're self-pollinating so you can completely cover them up keep the beetles off when the beetles come through when they come flying in and then your plants don't get eaten. And there's a lot of other examples of this, but uh, we're not really going into that because this is all about soil health. So let me go to the next slide here and talk about what we're talking about. What in the world do I mean when I say fix the soil and we fix pests and disease? 
because it is not a direct line from problem to killing a pest. That is not how I manage it. So that's not how I'm teaching you to manage it. <coughs> what we need to focus on, uh, plant a jungle, mix up your diversity. Don't plant big patches of one crop. Mix up your plant families. Mix up your species a lot. The rule of thumb I use is have four plant families growing together. So you may need to do a little bit of research on which plants belong to which family. It's kind of like a genealogy chart. You need to look and see how closely related certain plants are. So tomato plants and pepper plants are both in the nightshade family. So if you have tomatoes and peppers growing together, that counts as one plant family. So I use a lot of weeds to be able to have more than um, three plant families. I can get that fourth plant family by letting some weeds grow. <coughs> the reason you're going to do this is because when you have four plant families growing together, it, you're going to have a giant diversity of microbes that are growing in the soil. And the microbes will be growing and thriving and multiplying. And you should get a pretty good diversity. You should have over 100,000 microbes, maybe 250,000 microbes. What I mean by that is species of microbes, different specific types of microbes. Uh, when that happens, when you get those large populations of species, and of course there's billions and trillions of, of individuals, so many we can't even count them. But when you get that high diversity of these guys in the soil, there's a phenomenon that happens. And, and there, it's a synergistic relationship, and the scientists call it quorum sensing. That's spelled Q-U-O-R-A-M, quorum sensing. And the quorum sensing that they do, they, they can turn on genetics inside of plants. And so the plants get these genetics turned on that they normally don't turn on if you don't have four plant, plant families growing together, okay? So when the genetics in the plants are turned on, these are called secondary metabolites. And I have a list here on this slide of an example of secondary metabolites. There's probably a lot more. These are just some very simple ones. When I made this slide, I just pulled them right off the top of my head. So there's a lot more of secondary metabolites that could happen. But the plants start showing disease resistance, pest resistance, enhanced colors and flavors, and the growth is outstanding. There's maximum nutrition. A maximum of photosynthesis is taking place. The plant looks very healthy. It's very wide. It's tall. It's thick. It, um, you know, you just sometimes you can just see a plant and you're like, man, that really looks good. And that's usually a plant that is pretty healthy and if you have four plant families working together you're not going to see the pests and diseases attacking those plants and if you do they're going to be on the very bottom leaves that are touching the ground that are beginning to decompose anyway which is actually the ecological role of a pest in the disease is to decompose the old worn out used up plant material once it is dead so how do we get this to happen in our own gardens? Well, we want a, a low tillage or minimal tillage or even a no-till system. So if we eliminate the harsh tilling that has become so easy in our lifetimes with all the machinery, then that will help the fungus to grow in the soil. Um, fungus is the easiest to kill and it's the hardest to restore as far as the groups of microbiology. And so if we stop tilling and we start mimicking natural systems where there's no rotor tiller out there, then we start restoring the fungus in the soil. And that helps this to start to happen. When we add compost to the soil once a year, so in my gardening system, I like to add an inch of uh, dry compost to the soil surface in my garden beds every year, once a year. So I may plant four crops in one bed in a year, maybe five or six if I have a bunch of very quick crops like radishes, but I will only add the compost once a year. 
And what this is doing is it's feeding the microbes. It's restoring the microbes. We're getting more microbes out there. It's feeding them. It's giving them a house and a place to live. And so that's one food source. The other food source is what I have here on the slide number four, where we have living roots in the soil all year long, because when the exudates come out of the roots, which is the just liquid sugar that soaks into the ground from the root, that is another food source for the microbes. So in many of these classes, I have already told you the food for microbes. There's two sources. One is dead plant material. Number two is the exudates from plant roots. Those are the two sources. And what eats those things? That's the bacteria and the fungus. And then we have the protozoa group, which eats mostly bacteria. And then we have the nematodes. And there's five groups of those guys, but they, they eat all kinds of stuff, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, meaning they eat each other, they eat fungus. And then we have microarthropods. A lot of those guys are eating fungus. A lot of those are eating um, organic matter. And so this whole group together are creating the five spheres in the soil. And we've already had classes on that. But just to recap that, the five spheres are the uh, detritosphere, the agrotosphere, the porosphere, the rhizosphere, and the drillosphere. And when you have all five spheres present in your soil, then you have a good community set up for your microbes to be thriving. The mineralization will be happening. So you don't have to have any uh, like man-made pest, uh, like pesticides or man-made herbicides or any man-made fertilizers going into the system. It just simply grows without all of that stuff. And when that happens, that's when the quorum sensing goes on within the community of microbes and they turn on the genetics of secondary metabolites inside the plants and then the plants start exhibiting disease resistance, pest resistance, and that whole list I already read. And that is how I manage pest and disease in my food growing system. So, do I have any bugs eating anything in this greenhouse? Yes, I actually do. We were harvesting chard this week, and a bunch of the leaves were filled with holes being eaten. And so, I just picked those, and they went in the compost. But a lot of the leaves I was able to pick, and they went away to customers. So, what does that tell me? Does that tell me I need to get a bunch of pesticides out and spray my greenhouse to kill the bugs? No, that is the wrong conclusion to come to. What that tells me is that my soil is not functioning where that chart is growing. So I pulled out my soil compaction tester. I stuck it in the ground and about two inches down, I'm hitting 300 PSI. So it is growing in a very compacted soil. And so what did I do? I went and got some compost, like we talked about in our last week's class in compost management. And I got a handful of compost. I made up a quick extract. It took me like 90 seconds. And then I went and poured it on that chard um, all over the ground around the chard. It did, some did get on the chard, but the point was to get it on the soil. And so that restored the uh, microbes that will break up that hard pan and it will start creating the five spheres of the soil where that chart is. And that is how I would manage for pests and disease with any crop that I am growing. And so now <laughs> I think I've taught you everything I know about pest and disease management. Yeah, that's my last slide for today. So um, I'm gonna go back to this one here real quick need to take a screenshot of that, go ahead. I'm gonna give you five seconds. The one thing I didn't mention was this website here from the garden planner, the, at the territorial seed um, website. This is a great website. And if you are having a particular problem with a bug, if you simply want to identify a bug, you can go to this website. It's one of the best websites I've seen 
for an insect or any kind of bug um, identification. It tells you what it eats. Uh, and you can even look up pictures on here of a leaf that has holes in it. And it will show you a list of bugs that make that kind of a hole on a, uh, a leaf. So it's, it has lots of pictures. I don't know how many. Maybe 75. Maybe 175. I don't know. But there's a lot of pictures of identification. It's a great website. Good company. They've been around for years. And every time I've clicked on it, it's always worked. And they, so they keep this updated, which is pretty awesome. And back to the other slide there of what I actually do to manage to so that I don't have pests and disease. Keep the four plant families growing together. The roots need to be growing together. So you want to plant them kind of next to each other. There's the old gardening idea of companion planting or interplanting. Good ideas, good things to do. So this wraps up my uh, little speech for tonight. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, go ahead and ask those questions. Um, you can unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat and we can have a discussion about gardening. If you're having any garden problems, let me know and I will... See if I've ever had an experience with what you're experiencing. So Melanie has some questions. Um, All right, Melanie, let's hear it. Okay, one, just tonight, I found a snail. <laughs> okay, tell us about snails, I guess, or pests, if you have too many of them. Um, but what do you suggest? It was under a bunch of actually weed leaves, and I was pulling my weeds. Don't know if that was a good thing, but these weeds have runners, so I was pulling them. Um, anyway, what do you do with snails? Okay, so snails are a problem. They will eat the leaves of many, many plants. They love to eat all of the the leaves uh, of any kind of a brassica. So that means a cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, um, any of those brassica plants. They love to eat those. They'll also eat lettuce and maybe every garden crop there is. Uh, I have not lived in a lot of areas where there are a lot of snails, so I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with them. But I can tell you that snails <laughs> love to live between the wooden bed. Like if you have raised beds, they love to get in the crack between your soil and where the wooden sides of raised beds are. That's why I don't like raised beds. If you're living in cities anywhere, You'll probably have snail issues in all climates because snails tend to follow the commercial um, nursery industry. When you buy potted plants, um, use, a lot of times they are infested with snails. Mm -hmm. And when you plant those potted things in your garden, you, um, you risk um, infecting your area with snails. Even if you live in the arid west, where snails normally do not live. So I often teach people in my boot camps, I try to get people to grow everything from seed instead of buying potted stuff because there are actually other pests besides snails that you can bring in. Um, so that's, that's what I know about snails. What do you do with them? Um, go to the... Go to the store and buy a six pack of beer. <laughs> and I'm not joking. And bring it home and get something shallow like a mayonnaise lid. Like, you know, just a lid, a jar lid, a pickle jar lid, something. And you put the pickle jar lid out there and you pour some beer into the that. The smell of the beer will attract them. They go into it and then they die. They drowned in it. So <laughs> that is a good trap. That's pretty safe, and it's not going to hurt anything in your garden to have some beer out there. It's just, you know, whatever, some fermented whatever that they made the beer out of, some alcohol content. And so, uh, but that will trap your snails. If you're seeing a lot of damage on your plants, um, go out in the early morning before it gets light. That's usually when they're feeding. 
like four o'clock in the morning, four or five, before it gets light. And that's when you can, with a flashlight, shine it on those plants. And a lot of times you can see those snails on there. You can just pick them off and put them in a container and then take them away and throw them away. Um, yeah. If you have chickens, um, sometimes they will eat some snails. But even better than that is ducks love to eat snails. And so I've told this to people quite a bit. And so they put a bunch of ducks in their garden and then the ducks eat their whole garden too. But you've got to use, we have to use our brains about this. If you're going to do that, put the ducks out there for 20 minutes and then move the ducks away. Um, let them eat the snails while they're there. But don't just turn a bunch of ducks in. That's like, you know, putting a bunch of teenagers in your house for two weeks with no adult supervision. And they like to cook. You think you'll have a kitchen left? Yeah, I mean, you gotta, we gotta think this through and be adult about it. Um, so that's everything I know about snails. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of personal experience with snails. When I gardened in California, there were an amazing amount of snails. And that's where I did the trick in the morning when I would pick them off early in the morning. Um, and that does work well. You can control them. But any kind of a crack in the ground, any board on the ground, a piece of trash on the ground, um, big chunks of wood chips on the ground, those types of things, the snails will get under that during the day to hide. And so you can um, you can even trap them by putting down a piece of plywood or, or like a two by four, water it a lot so that it's moist underneath. And during the day when the sun's up, move that to the side and you can find them there and then destroy them. Um, I, I, I don't know if Helena has a, or Helena, I don't know if she has a question. I have another one. Um, you said you add compost once a year. Do you do that in the fall, William, or in the spring? Um, I do it when I have finished compost. So I like to wait until my compost is about, you know, 14 to 20 months old. I certainly want to use it before it's two years old, but somewhere around that year and a half range is usually when it has collected the uh, maximum amount of spores and cysts of, you know, the really beneficial microbes. And then that's when you want to use it. So if you use the, uh, if you use it up and, and then you just like, because let's just say I'm going to do it every spring, but then I have a compost that's going to be 29 months old, then it's getting too old. Those spores and cysts are starting to not be viable anymore. So it doesn't matter what time of year you do it. You just want to do it when your compost is, is good and right and ready. So spring is a great time. Fall is a great time. In the middle of the summer when your plants are big is a great time. It's never a bad time to add good finished compost to your soil. <laughs> I have another question. I have um, spots in our square foot garden where things didn't grow. And I was thinking, hmm, wonder if I should plant some rye or some kind of cover crop. Or should I, we still have time to plant things. Or should I just throw in some lettuce seeds or something that will grow quickly in those square foot areas that are not um. producing? You know, I always tell people with small gardens like you have, I always tell them, eat something edible that you're going to eat. Um, the cover crop species that I talk about, and I know I talk about them a lot, that's more in context of people with a larger piece of land. Um, but where you have small gardens, grow like 100% of something you're actually going to consume. Okay. So, so that's it. We do have a question from Helena here. She says, tomato worms will healthy soil really prevent those? The honest answer, Helena, is I don't know. I do not know. Um, my soil is coming along in my solar greenhouse. And this is, uh, you know, what i don't even know how old it is now it's getting close to two years of growing in there um this fall late fall it'll be two years since i started and my pest resistance in there has been phenomenally awesome this year i've had a very um good presence of aphids and i have had very very low damage to my crops almost none I mean, just maybe a handful of plants have I gotten rid of on the aphids. 
Um, tomato worms, I don't know. Um, uh, yes, chickens. Um, Helena also put on here. Our chickens are loving them. You know, when I was a kid, we used to have a lot of those big old giant tomato worms. They had the big horn on them, you know. Some people call them the a horn worm or a tomato horn worm or just tomato worm. So those different common names for those. But we would pick them off and then would take them and feed them to the chickens, you know. We just, we little kids are weird, you know. We would take a big old worm, we'd hold it out, and the chicken would pluck it out of our hand. We thought that was so great. But, uh, yeah, the chickens do love them. So, you know, here here's the philosophy, Helena, behind what I'm saying. I really believe that all life has a really good purpose. And if something is super annoying us, then my take on it is I don't understand its ecological role. And so when something is frustrating me, I need to step back and ask the question, for what purpose was this created? Was it really created by a loving Heavenly Father to torment me personally? Is that really the reason? Or does it have an ecological role that could bless my life if I understood it? And once I started thinking that way, I've stopped killing stuff because I always used to always just grab anything that would eat a plant. And I'd kill it, you know, like a grasshopper. You just grab one, pull them in half, and you go along your way, and you don't even think about it. But recently, I've not been doing that. And it's been interesting to see because I have not had any great um, problems at all. In fact, my pest and disease problems are getting much better. I don't think it's because I'm not killing pests. I think it's because I'm understanding the soil science. And so I'm really focusing on building a beautiful agrotosphere where all of those pests, I mean, the beneficials can live. And now the pests can just do their job of decomposing. Because if you, if, like, if you walk out in your pasture and a cow pie is still there, three or four months after the cow put it there, then you know that your mineral cycle is not working in your area. Um, there should be dung beetles there that eat it. Within two weeks, it should be gone. And if that does happen, then you know your mineral cycle is working. And so by understanding these little tricks that where you can walk out and just observe nature and know what's happening, um then you know that helps me to know if it's really working so is it gonna is this really gonna help tomato worms i think so because it's fixing everything else i've seen <laughs> but i don't know <clears throat> am i worried about it not at all because like you say you know kids love to pick them off and feed them to the chickens <laughs> so that's pretty great Okay, any more questions? So do you have more pests outdoors than you have indoors? Uh, no, it's about the same. Yeah, outside the greenhouse and inside the greenhouse is about the same. Oh. Yeah. Okay, man, so it's it's because you are uh, doing these things uh, to prevent the pests. Then. My, my management is the very same outside and inside. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, I'm not doing anything different inside the greenhouse than I do outside. It, it's certainly a different climate because it's a year-round year growing environment in the greenhouse with very minimal frosts in the winter. So, you know, different climate, but uh, but management's the same. Okay. So so we're uh, going to build a flatten an area and put topsoil in it. And so it's it's only about 65 by 30 feet. Uh, should we put uh, um, a, a crop on, uh, on that? Uh, uh, I mean, it's going to be, when we bring topsoil in, it, it'll be dead topsoil, I'm sure. Yeah, most likely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's pretty good garden size. I would go ahead and plant a multi-species cover crop on there. You okay. know, so you're you're talking about northern Utah, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's always tricky with you guys cuz I never know where you are, but <laughs> um yeah, so northern Utah, I would just do a multi-species cover crop. Get some I would get at least like 20 different things to plant. So a whole bunch of grasses, a whole bunch of brassicas, 
and a whole bunch of uh, tap roots. So let me name a few plants you could plant. Grasses would mean um, you don't want anything that's a perennial. Make sure when you get this seed, you want nothing that's a perennial. Um, so grasses would be oats, barley, wheat, rye, triticale, and it doesn't matter what uh, varieties. But those are going to have massive, uh, like, what am I thinking? Um, massive fibrous roots. And those fibrous roots are going to get a lot of carbon from the air and put it in the soil. So a lot of grasses, okay? But remember, they're all annual grasses. There's even a thing called annual ryegrass you could um, plant, which is different than, than uh, it's very different than the, the cereal rye. But whatever, whatever grasses you plant, you want an annual one. You want it to die either in the winter or you want it to die out once the, it ripens the next summer because all these grains are going to ripen in July or and be dead by August. Okay? But they're going to fix your soil. So at the same time when you plant those, and, and I'm assuming the best time to plant these is in the fall, but if you don't get it done before fall, you just plant them whenever. Okay. Um, and then your uh, your broad leaves, or not broad leaves, but so so you want to avoid uh, alfalfa then. Yes, that's well, avoid a alfalfa because it is a perennial. Okay. Unless you want to have an alfalfa field, but you're you're making a garden for vegetables, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want no perennials. So broad leaf. Broad leaf is next. That would be brassicas. So brassicas. You want a whole bunch of brassicas. You want uh, you want kale and any of the mustards. Any of the vegetable mustards would be good. Um, and and then also some of the brassicas are actually in the taproot, like the the daikons. So daikon radishes. Um, there's the big black Spanish radishes. There's the mango wurzel radish. Those guys can get 30 pounds. They're gigantic. And you're not eating any of these. You're letting the earthworms eat in. You're letting the winter kill this stuff. And that's going to make the most beautiful soil in northern Utah. And then you want some legumes in there. Probably the best legume is going to be what is called hairy vetch. H-A-I-R-Y-G-O-V-E-T-C-H. Yeah, hairy vetch. And, and, and what is that? It's a legume. It's a legume that's, that's an annual. Um, another legume that would work are peas. Just any kind of a garden pea. Do we eat those? Uh, yeah, you can, but you're not supposed to because you're trying to feed the worms. Okay. But if they ripen, go ahead and eat them. It's fine. Um, and then there, of course, if you're growing it in the um, summertime, in the middle of the summer, then you're going to want the warm species legume, and that would be green beans. Get a whole bunch of green beans growing out there. Um, and and so when the weeds grow, you're going to let them grow. You're not going to weed this at all. That's against the law. You cannot weed this because you want as many roots in the soil as possible. And then you need some good fungal feeders. So you need to plant a whole bunch of sunflowers. They're oh. going to get really tall. And then when they die, they're going to be really woody and hard. Uh -huh. Like big sticks standing there. And then you're going to go out there and knock them down so they're on the ground. And then the snow comes in the winter. And the fungus will begin to eat them. So you have a lot of good fungus food out there. We have sunflowers growing in the slope already perfect so, uh, so, that, so that would be a pretty good mix right there that i just told you if, if you can get 15 to 20 species that'd be great okay okay and then it's just going to die on top of the soil and what are we going to do with it after it dies what are we going to put on top of that then you're going to walk on it a lot so that it's smashed down flat you're going to pray for a two feet of snow to get on top of it 
and then the microbes are going to start eating it. And then next year you go out there with a sharp stick and you poke holes all over the place. And that's where you put all your garden vegetables is right in there. And it's going to be the worst looking garden you could absolutely imagine. Your neighbors are going to be laughing at you and it's going to be embarrassing. And you will have the most nutrient dense food from anything you pick out of there. It's going to be great. All right, we're excited. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Um, I have another question. I know there's other people that do too, but before I forget, you mentioned, I know and you've gone over this before, but you mentioned you made a real quick compost tea for uh -huh. your plant there. Yeah. What did you, what'd you use? Okay, I mean, so I, I just used the compost out of my worm bin. Okay. That's like a year and a half old, like I said before. You just take two or three cups of that. And you mix it in a whole bunch of water until uh -huh. it's thoroughly mixed. Okay. But you mix it by hand. You don't put that in a blender. If you put it in a blender, it will kill your microbes. So don't do that. Just mix it up by hand. And then you put it and you just go put it a couple of cups around every plant out there. Or you just put it on the ground everywhere. And how would you, did you use like a five-gallon bucket of water, William? Or how much yeah. water? Yeah, yeah. Bucket? Yeah, okay. like 10. So it would be about 10 cups of compost would do a five-gallon bucket of water. Okay. And it only takes one minute to mix that up. Oh. And then what did you do with the compost? Because I guess you strained it, didn't you? I do strain it because I have a lot of earthworms in my compost. So I want to keep the earthworms in the bin. So any solids that are left over, including the living earthworms that are still in there, they just go back in the, in the compost bin. Perfect. Okay. But if I wanted to get earthworms in the garden, then I would certainly uh, just take the, I would just not strain it and just put them right out there and then they'll just go in the ground. Because you need worms in your garden too. So yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. Helena has another comment here. Um, she says, I got to say, we have a jungle type garden this year and love it. And I never see, um, and I have never seen so many beneficial critters at my place. Toads like crazy, praying mantids. I see way less pests doing a garden the way we learned from you. Hallelujah. It's so <laughs> nice to hear this from people because we know it works, but it is such a different mindset. It's mind blowing to think. I'm not going to till, I'm not going to pull a weed, all these crazy things that we never learned in our youth. But now that we have learned them, when we actually do it, it's wonderful. My question to Helena is, are you eating the food and does it taste better? Most people would not send food to a lab to get a nutritional um, test done, but um, there are people who do, mostly the, the science geeks like me. And then the nutritional tests are coming back at the top of the charts, which is pretty awesome. Because isn't that the point, is to grow some healthy food? Well, it is for me. So that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, Helena just typed in the chat. She said, tastes yummy. So that's pretty great. It's working. Uh, another question. Sorry. Uh, our uh, our uh, tomatoes are still green and someone told us it be, it's because the weather's too hot um yeah the weather certainly has a lot to do with it i always like to grow um tomatoes with early maturing dates so when you buy your tomato seed it will tell you like are they a 90 day tomato or a 120 day tomato or a 140 day tomato what that means is how long it takes from when you plant it to when you they will ripen romas are popular for canning but they have a very long ripening period and so people who grow romas in the upper elevations of the great basin desert area meaning utah nevada idaho um, a lot of times they don't even get red romas because it takes too long before the frost comes so um, you want to go with varieties that will ripen uh, like, you know, 65, 70, 80 days. And usually those are smaller tomatoes. If you want a big old slicer, you're usually looking at a good 90 days. 
Um, some of the best um, ones for early, but a good slicer would be like an early girl, you know. But and then there's lots of there's hundreds of varieties out there, so you just have to do your research and look at that. But well, we have early girls, but they're green. they're green, and they're tipping over right now, John. We've got wind out there, yeah. So now our okay. I got a question about your tomatoes. Are the is the color of the leaves super dark green? Uh, well, we we had some that didn't turn out well, but some are very very green. Yeah. yeah. That super dark green color means there's a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So they're putting yeah. a lot of leaf growth that does slow down the ripening of the fruit. Okay. So what if it's medium green, which I think it that's is. It's probably doing fine. That's a good thing. And then we have some that just, I don't know, they almost look purpley, yellowish. Uh, yeah. and they were my prize tomatoes. I hope I get uh -huh. them. Out so I can use the seed for next year, but yeah, yeah, purple, purple in the tomatoes. Usually, it's on the underside of the leaves and the stems, and that's a like a phosphorus deficiency. But here okay. again, it doesn't mean you need to add phosphorus. It means you need to get your five spheres working so that you have the right minerals. I mean the the right mineralizers, meaning the funguses and the bacteria in the soil to make the phosphorus available to the the tomato plant okay okay so just keep making your compost i know you got your compost going melanie so just keep working at it inoculate it good and so that you get those minerals you know those mineralizers out there when you say inoculate it you mean the you uh, the compost extract is what i mean okay oh sure okay I'll do it tomorrow. Perfect. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Um, I don't have any questions in the chat. If you have any questions in the chat, go ahead and ask them. Okay, I have a question about aphids. Leslie was... Oh, does Leslie have a question? Leslie, do you have a question? I'm worried if she has I, I don't I don't think Leslie has a question. Okay, um, I found a small, tiny looks like I think they're aphids on one of my rose bushes. Um, I just pulled them off like this, but they could be all over the bush. It's a climber. Um, yeah. What would you suggest? Just so, yeah, rose bushes they do attract lots and lots of aphids for sure. Um, I would get some Castile soap. Do you know what that is? Sure do. Yeah, just get some liquid Castile soap. Most oh. of the time, it's just made out of like coconut oil. Okay. I mean, you can probably eat it. It's, I mean, I wouldn't recommend eating it, but it's very safe is my point. Just mix maybe a couple of tablespoons of that in a gallon of water. And just put it in a little sprayer, just like a, just any kind of a spray bottle. Spray it all over your rose bushes. What that soap will do is it's going to um, coat the aphid with the soap. And then the aphid can't breathe and it's going to die and fall off. But if the soap does not get on the aphid while your spray is wet, it won't kill the aphid. So you have to thoroughly saturate all of the plant meaning you're getting all of the aphids wet with a film of soap. But that will kill them. And it's a great way to kill them because it's uh it's super safe. It's not gonna hurt anything. It's just it's like the most gentle soap in the world. So thank you. I think I even have some perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, Helena, we have a, we have a, and so if we come for a three day set, a session, is is fall a good time to do it, or should we wait till next? Yeah, week? I haven't scheduled one yet. If people want to do one, I can certainly schedule one. You know, um, do you guys have a greenhouse? No. No, but we have. We're going to have a four foot wall. Uh huh. Well, yeah, have yeah. Well, I was thinking of doing a fall boot camp uh, just to teach people how to manage a greenhouse, you know. 
So focus on greenhouse management. Um, I normally do my boot camps in the spring when gardening season shows up, when most people are interested in getting the garden going. So, yeah. Because I didn't get pepperoni pizza. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> okay. Is there anybody else who has any questions here tonight? I, I'm going to ask you, John has not seen our tomato plants. In the square foot garden, it's raised. They really are leaning over. Um, I don't want them to pop out with the wind that we're getting right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Bowie, you guys better go out there and fight the wind. <laughs> Jess, we got to go out with our lights on because it's you huh? can see the darkness. Um, what would you suggest to rescue them? <laughs> I don't know. Just get a big post and stick it in the ground to tie them up to. Okay. Well, <laughs> they, they'll survive. They'll be all oh, right. You don't know. know. They're really leaming over, John. You haven't seen it. Yeah. You know what happens when I do this? These all For 20 years, I've been teaching gardening classes. And for 20 years, I've become a marriage counselor. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm in trouble when you guys start talking like that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down tonight. Can and somebody... uh, hopefully this helped. If you have one last question, go ahead and ask it, and I'll do my best to answer. In the chat, was there a question? Uh, no, it's Helena just had said it tastes yummy, and, yummy, and then he, she said, thanks, William, you're the best. Okay. So thank you guys, too. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank really you. Have a good night. Good night. We will see you next week. Perfect. Thank okay. You. We'll be here. All right.